Hey there, visual politic community. Have you ever noticed that if we take a look at the map of the world and analyze it in detail, you'll realize there are some very unusual borders. For example, the one between Spain and Morocco through the cities of Ceuta and Melilla is one that attracts a lot of attention. The ones separating Israel from Gaza and the West Bank are also some of the most strange. What can I say? But let me ask you a question. Do you know of any island with a strange border? Do you know of a case of an island split in half and where the two halves, how should we put it politely, can't stand each other very well? Well, yes, such islands and borders do exist. Many of you may be thinking of the borders between Brunei and Indonesia or Papua New Guinea and tiny East Timor or maybe you're thinking about Cyprus or Ireland. However, this time we are not heading to Southeast Asia, nor will we stay in Europe. Today, we will find our protagonists in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. Because it turns out there is another island in the Caribbean that is also home to two countries. Can you tell me which one it is? Three, two, one, bingo. Indeed, we are talking about the island of Hispaniola. And it is precisely here where we find the Dominican Republic and the Republic of Haiti. Two very different countries, both in terms of culture and economic and social development. If you remember the video we made on visual politic about Haiti, you will know perfectly well that this island could be the perfect board for the perfect set for Grand Designs Island Edition. We're talking about two countries that also share a murky history of old border fights, something that seemed to have been overcome. Yet, in the last two years, border tensions have resurfaced. The rise of Haitian gangs has toughened the Dominican Republic's border and immigration policy. Of course, besides the gangs, there is another powerful reason that has intensified the tension. We are talking once again about natural resources, especially in this case, a very particular one, water. Visual politics viewers, how did this atypical and controversial border come to be established? What is the Dominican Republic doing to try and curb the rise of Haitian gangs? Why do we say that the two Spanish-speaking countries are at loggerheads over water? Today, we are going to answer these questions, but first, we have to start the story at the beginning. One below after another. If there's one thing that can unite both the Dominican Republic and the Haitian nation, it's their past as colonies of two European empires, the Spanish and the French. Specifically, Haiti achieved independence from France in 1804, and the Dominican Republic did the same from Spain in 1821. From then on, far from extending a hand, a century of constant struggles between the two countries began. Above all, for one reason, the continuous Haitian invasion attempts. It seems that having a new country to build was not enough for them. Only one year after gaining its independence, the Dominican Republic was invaded by the Haitian leader, Jean-Pierre Boyer, who would dominate all of Hispaniola from 1822 to 1844. Boyer soon earned the hatred of the Dominicans with measures such as the expulsion of teachers from the country, the expropriation of land from the church, and the obligation to repay part of the debt that Haiti had contracted with France years before. And so, in 1844, the Dominican Republic, led by Juan Pablo Duarte and Pedro Santana, among others, managed to gain independence again again, only this time from neighboring Haiti. Nevertheless, Haiti's attacks did not cease. For example, in 1855, the Haitian emperor, Faustin I, sent 30,000 soldiers to the Dominican Republic with the intention of conquering it again, but this time he was unsuccessful. Since then, Haiti has never again launched large-scale attacks to take the Dominican Republic, but with the failure of all negotiations and mediations, the French-speaking nation did continue to make small incursions into Dominican territory. But then 1929 came, and that brought with it, finally, a peace treaty, recognizing the 1856 borders of the two countries. The Dominican Republic then had to give up a border region that had been occupied by Haiti after 1856, but other than that, the agreement was well received by the governments of both countries. But not surprisingly, the story did not end there. The agreement was on the verge of being broken by a terrible and despicable event, the Parsley Massacre on the Dahabon in 1937. You see, in 1930, this man you see on the screen came to power in the Dominican Republic, Rafael Leonidas Trujillo. He was a lieutenant colonel and chief of staff when he successfully carried out the coup that put him in power. Under Trujillo, the policy towards Haitians was hardened to, trust me, completely terrifying levels. Historical resentment for the continual Haitian invasions and, above all, an openly racist ideology led Trujillo to order the ethnic cleansing of Haitians in the Dominican Republic. Yep, 
That's what I said. Between the 2nd and the 8th of October, 1937, the Dominican military, using criminals and convicts armed with machetes and bayonets, killed between 9,000 and 20,000 Haitians, both on Dominican soil and on the border itself. It was a true and atrocious massacre. However, despite this, the agreement remained in place and, in the end, both the dictator Trujillo and the Haitian, Eli Lesko, put a definitive end to the border disputes in 1942. The border was then free of fighting and, since then, both Haitians and Dominicans have been able to pass from one side to the other with relative flexibility. Even so, as I was telling you before, since 2021, the border has become red hot again, and all because of a new threat capable of disrupting everything, Haitian gangs. Listen up. The profound Haitian chaos. I think we all know that Latin America is experiencing a wave of violence that is making countries that seemed reasonably safe just five years ago, such as Ecuador, Chile, and Costa Rica, to now register alarming crime rates. Nevertheless, despite the worrisome situation in these countries, nothing compares to what is happening in Haiti. We already told you here on Visual Politic how the phenomenon of gangs and militias in Haiti is not exactly something new. In fact, we can trace them back to the 1950s with the Tonton Macu during the Duvalier dictatorship. Typically, these gangs were in the service of politicians and businessmen who were seeking both protection and greater power. However, in 2021, we were faced with news that would change the Haitian landscape dramatically. Haitian President Jovenel Moise assassinated at his home by unidentified gunmen. Indeed, in July 2021, mercenaries, mostly Colombians, assassinated the then president, Jovenel Moise. Following that event, this man you see on screen, Ariel Henry, took over the presidency of the country on a temporary basis. But despite this, the gangs noted that Moise's assassination had left a tremendous power vacuum, a vacuum which, not surprisingly, they were quick to fill. The country now has nearly 200 gangs, 100 of which are present in the Haitian capital, Port-au-Prince, which has become a veritable jungle of predatory gangs. In fact, for many, the capital has already fallen completely into the hands of these gangs. Gangs such as the Mawozo 400, considered the most extensive in the country, or the G9, the most powerful coalition of gangs in all of Haiti, already control the coast of Port-au-Prince, which is precisely where the major port terminals for the country's commerce are located. As you can imagine, this gives them enormous power. But to give you an idea of just how much power they have accumulated, you should know that the G9 even took over the Varu terminal, which is the main oil terminal in the country. Haiti was then left without fuel, and the Haitian National Police had to redouble its efforts to gain back access. Visual politics viewers, the situation of violence in the Caribbean nation has reached such a level that even the interim president, Ariel Henry, has called for an international military intervention in the country. Crazy. But okay, sure. I'm certain many of you are wondering, but Jake, how does this affect the Dominican Republic? Well, you see, the truth is that the Dominican Republic plays a crucial role here for one simple reason. It's one of the main hubs of drug and arms trafficking from which Haitian gangs profit. According to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the Dominican Republic is one of the main access points for weapons arriving from Florida and destined for Haitian gangs. In fact, to give you an idea, in the first six months of 2022, and in the port of Haina alone, in Santo Domingo West, 112,000 units of weapons and ammunition from the United States were confiscated. And not only that, the Dominican Republic also plays a key role in drug trafficking, a fundamental business for Haitian gangs. In other words, the Dominican Republic has become a kind of crime market market for Haitian gangs, both an entry and exit point of that market, because we are talking about an island that has become a very important distribution point for the shipment of narcotics to both Western Europe and the United States. This chaotic situation in Haiti has led the Dominican Republic to tighten measures for every entry into the country from the other side of the island. Fearing that Haitian gangs could extend their activity into the Dominican Republic, Luis Abinader, the president of the country, has not hesitated in carrying out a massive deportation campaign. A campaign that has made no distinction by age or gender. So, for example, in 2022, it came to deport 171,000 people, 102% more than in 2021. And take note because in 2023 it's expected that the number of deportations could reach 250,000. For the time being however and despite everything the borders have remained relatively open especially to facilitate trade between the two countries. Nevertheless recent events are changing this reality. Tensions on the border have returned after decades of relative stability and trust me Abinada is proving that he's not taking the situation lying down. Check it out. the Dominican Trump, 
Remember the worldwide uproar when Donald Trump said he wanted to build a wall between the US and Mexico? It was an idea that marked his 2016 campaign and about which the international media talked non-stop. Well, do you know who has also announced the construction of a wall and is fulfilling his promise? Indeed, Luis Abinader himself. Controversial wall to separate prosperous Dominican Republic and impoverished Haiti. Once completed, the border fence, an impressive four meter high concrete and steel construction, will span some 164 kilometers and divide the Dominican Republic from neighboring Haiti. President Abinader has argued that one of his main objectives for this wall is to keep potential Haitian gang members and criminals out of the Dominican Republic. Yet another reason is to better control migratory flows. Haiti is a place of economic and social chaos mired in deep levels of violence. So, as you can imagine, in the last two years, hundreds of thousands of Haitians have flooded into the Dominican Republic, which has created a severe strain on hospital care. And not only that, with all this new labor available, Dominican wages have also fallen. Keep in mind that Haitians offer their labor at a lower price. That explains why a large part of the Dominican population has welcomed this measure with open arms. But naturally, there is no shortage of critics. Many say that the war will be useless and that the corruption of the Dominican border soldiers will allow Haitians to pass in exchange for bribes. Others fear that the war will hinder the entry of Haitian workers who are crucial to the Dominican economy. Consider, for example, that 80% of the labor force in the Dominican Republic's agricultural sector is Haitian. However, this does not have to be too concerning. After all, it doesn't mean that Haitians will not be able to enter their neighboring country, only that there will be a stricter control of access. In other words, it won't necessarily affect Haitian workers. <laughs> Even so, in September of this year, we came across another piece of news that came as a real shock and made it very clear that the border situation between the two countries was once again heating up. Dominican Republic announces it will close its border with Haiti over water dispute. The measure comes amidst a conflict over access to a river shared by both countries. Indeed, visual politic community Luis Abinader ordered to close the border with Haiti because of a dispute over water from the Massacre River, also known as the Dahabon River. You see, the thing is, in 2018, Haiti started to build an irrigation system using the river's water for crops growing in the Maribaru Plain. Construction was suspended when Jovenel Moise was assassinated in 2021. But farmers in the area decided to resume construction themselves in August of this year. After all, construction was already 60% complete. Well, the fact is that when the Haitian farmers resumed construction, Abinader was furious. The Dominican president demanded that construction be stopped, saying it would affect more than 14,000 hectares of Dominican farmland and the Saladilla Lagoon, one of the country's few wetlands. In the end, the president decided to suspend the issuance of visas to Haitians and finally to completely close the border with Haiti. Faced with this serious situation, which goes beyond the limits of the neighboring country, directly affecting our interests and legitimate rights, we have understood the need to give a forceful response in legitimate defense against uncontrollable groups that do not obey the Haitian constitutional order. However, the border closure has not only affected Haitians, but also the thousands of Dominicans who depend on trade with Haiti. For example, in the Dahabon, a Dominican border town, the citizens live largely from this trade, and when the borders were closed, the economic devastation was soon felt. It should be noted that, according to the mayor of the town, Santiago Riveron, every week the equivalent of $4 million is traded in the binational market of Dahabon. And as in this municipality, the same happens at other border crossings such as Elias Pena or Pedanales. That is why, in the middle of October 2023, the Dominican government was forced to partially reopen some border enclaves to reactivate trade with the neighboring country. It is true, there is still a strict control on the access of Haitians, but this is already one step closer to a return to normality. Meanwhile, Haiti's farmers and government have not given in. They defend their right to exploit their own natural resources, and well, they're right. After all, the canal they're building has its origins in the two and a half kilometers of river on Haitian soil. What's more, it's logical that they would seek the construction of this canal, with food insecurity affecting at least five of its 11 and a half million citizens. It's estimated that the canal would increase rice cultivation in such a way as to ensure food for at least four million Haitians. This position is also shared by the former president and candidate of the Dominican opposition for the May 2024 elections, Lionel Fernandez. He relied on a study by the National Institute of Water Resources of the Dominican Republic to support the Haitian project and called the Dominican government's position exaggerated and hypocritical, especially considering that the Dominican Republic has 11 canals similar to the one Haiti is building. So you see, the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic is once again under enormous tension. The increase in criminality in Haiti due to gangs and the conflict over the water of 
of the Massacre River has brought border tension back into the spotlight. President Abinader has acted forcefully, building a wall, lightening entry policies for Haitians and even partially closing the borders. Many have supported him, others have branded him an exaggerator, an opportunist and a populist. Who knows that such measures are very popular with an electoral that will be called to vote in May 2024. But what do you think? Do you think these measures are fair or exaggerated? And do you think they will be able to reach an agreement to reopen the borders? You can leave me your answer in the comments. As always, don't forget that here on Visual Politic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and hit that little bell so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it and see you in the next one. All the best and see you soon.